everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, November 16th, 2014. I am loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> Adam, it's so good for me this week. I am liking the actor so far. I'm stunned by how very similar it feels to as if Michael Mooney were playing it. I love the whole vibe that's around the scenes. Um, Michael had called into my voicemail this past week and hit the nail on the head for me of what I needed to describe it. It's very gothic. They've kind of mentioned um, uh, uh, Michelangelo, even though it's like Renaissance, but it's kind of that old world vibe. We've got le we've got that in the set, and then we have the introduction of new characters. I can't even tell you how many waves of speculation I went through this week just to find out, trying to find out who the heck this Constance woman is. How is she related to Sage? How on earth does she know Adam? Are these people good? People? Are they bad people? At the beginning of the week, Adam's tr trying to get away from them. <laughs> he wants to get back to Genoa City, get back to his life, and Sage sticks him in the arm with a needle, <laughs> sending him back to sleep. I thought, are they holding him hostage? <laughs> what is going on? It really has a, a strong teaser element to it that's just keeping me looking at my screen like, what? What? It's it's intriguing to me. And uh, Constance, I mean, never mind Sage. We saw her last week. I had theorized that maybe she was Sky. I still kind of wonder if, but Constance, who is this woman? I thought, is she Hope? Please tell me it's not Hope, because we were getting hints of this is going to be a plastic surgery storyline. Please tell me. They're not going to try to tell me that Hope never died and this is her and she's had reconstructive surgery and is off living somewhere. I didn't want to hear that. Um, Gary had called into my voicemail and theorized maybe it's Victor's mother. Who is this woman? <laughs> Who on earth could she be? Um, I, it's, it got increasingly weird as the week went on and she started to refer to Adam like you're gonna look just like she called him my grandson and then referred to him as Gabriel and the vibe that I've gotten from from what I've gathered on Monday through Friday's show just in my assessment it seems like she paid for or facilitated Adam's reconstructive surgery so that he would look like her grandson? <laughs> what? Is this like some sick old lady or are they conning her on some level? I still sort of get that sky vibe out of the woman we will now call Sage. Um, and I kind of thought, well, are they like trying to trick her to get what they want out of her maybe she's a rich old lady i have no i still don't entirely know but i'm i'm loving the way that it's it's developing um gosh i it's, they 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 he's in bandages adam is in bandages and they bring in a doctor who's been doing the plastic surgery on him and he's adam's ready to go home he's ready to get back to his life and he's convinced uh constance that uh that it's time for her to see her grandson's face i don't i don't know does she i, I don't know <laughs> There's still so many question marks floating up in the air for me that I that I love that. That's the part that I enjoy. I like not knowing. I like not feeling that it's predictable, and it's definitely not predictable. So they bring in this plastic surgeon to unveil the bandages. I thought that was a really good sequence. I got into it. Every little snip of the scissors, taking those bandages off of Adam's face, and then slowly wrapping him off of him and revealing his the way they reveal 
revealed his face to the family. Like you can only see Adam from the back of his head. And before we ever see what the face looks like, we're seeing Constance and Sage and the doctor's reaction. I couldn't tell if they were happy or horrified. It was suspense. That's what I love. I love the suspense. <laughs> ah, so, a couple scenes later, we see Constance is very, very happy. Um, she thinks he looks just like her grandson, and there is a moment where Adam looks into the mirror and says, it's uncanny. So, did he, he must have somehow agreed to this. She doesn't, as far as I can tell, she doesn't think it's her grandson, unless she does and, and thinks that, okay, okay. So from the preview of Monday's show, there was a scene where Constance is talking to Adam and saying something about, um, I'm so glad you were there to rescue that man out of that burning car and then said something about Adam Newman is no good and he deserves to burn in hell or something like that. So she doesn't know she's dealing with Adam Newman. I don't know if maybe we always had that third man at the scene, the hitchhiker who saw the crash and uh, who presumably saw Adam or somebody saw somebody wander off through the woods. So was that her grandson? Did Adam maybe switch places with him? Like, is it her? I, I don't know. <laughs> I need these blanks to be filled in for me. I don't know if Adam agreed uh, to the reconstructive surgery uh, because he just needed somebody to foot the bill for it or somebody to take care of him because there is a sense of Constance and Sage love him and want to take care of him. And there's also a sense, I think, that Sage is sort of in it in on it like she knows that there's some BS going on in this situation and is trying to maybe protect Constance or maybe feels a little bit bad about what they're pulling on them you guys have got to let me know what on earth you think like the real story from A to Z is here let's do some predicting <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of predicting um, but there's a, the, a, what's clear at this point is that Adam is getting stronger every single day and he wants to be back home with his wife and with his son and he's not happy that Billy has moved into his house. He's been looking at that spy cam for months and months now and finally this week Chelsea finds the camera. It's stuffed up, what was it, stuffed up in a light fixture or a fan or I can't remember where it was but she's up there rooting around. She knocks down the camera and is very unnerved by it. Why is there a camera in my son's nursery? There's something just, I would feel so completely violated. I don't think she quite knows what to make of it. Uh, Billy gets involved and he doesn't like it either. They both immediately assume, or Billy really immediately assumes, that it's Victor. Who else would have any kind of motive? But Chelsea says, no, Victor can come and go as he wants. He can see Connor whenever he wants. He doesn't have to plant a spy cam. There's something bigger something different going on here and Chelsea has never really been able to allow herself to accept that Adam is dead she never saw the body and she held on to the idea that he was still alive for quite a long time until she eventually decided to move on but rattling around in the back of her head has got to be the fact that that handkerchief was returned to her and that she's had a feeling that Adam's still out there so she's kind of being very very reserved about it but Billy is really wanting to know he's he believes Adam's dead and he wants to know who the heck on earth would be putting a spy cam in Connor's nursery so he does a little bit of digging and they find out that the camera is a new model it's some that's it would have had to have been purchased after Adam already died so now they're realizing this is something that's happened recently Chelsea remembered that that guy was in there checking on the buzzing sound so she's thinking that that's when the camera was planted I don't know if next week they're going to be uh, hunting him hunting down that guy the the so-called 
maintenance guy and getting close to the truth. I don't know um, if Chelsea and Billy are going to realize the truth before Adam makes his grand entrance back into Genoa City, but that's totally where this is going. He has a new face. He can return to town. Nobody's going to know it's him, which is kind of beautiful. I, I sort of like that. I wasn't expecting to like that, but I think it gives Adam the chance to get back into town undetected, find out what the lay of the land is, and also search around for a way to clear his name. That has got to be top of the agenda. Yes, 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 la la la. Billy and Chelsea are getting close and all that stuff. But you've got to clear your name, Adam. So I kind of like that he's going to have that opportunity to get in there and do that undetected. You know that there's going to be scenes very soon where Adam, with his new face, is going to come into contact with Chelsea and she's going to get the weirdest vibe in the world. Woo! <laughs> I'm so excited. So excited for Adam's return back into Genoa City, and I know that that's what's going to happen because we saw that the new actor is billed in the opening credits this week. It was Friday's show was the first time we saw them. I had I went back and watched that four times. I kid you not. I was like, oh my god, I gotta, gotta see that again. <laughs> Woo! I just, there's something about it that gave me chills. I, 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 and I just, I, I, there was something like, I liked the side-by-sides too. Like the one on the left side of your screen was kind of smiley and cocky, but the one on the right side of the screen, there was something kind of magical about it. And I think it is got to be, I'm only guessing, but to me it almost looked like a scene where Adam returns to the athletic club for the first time because, and re kind of makes makes his public return. I wouldn't be surprised if the very first time we see Adam back in Genoa City, he's walking through the athletic club door. Because there's just something about the way the camera was panning in on his face uh, and, and the look on his face. I just, just from those opening credits, I got a sense of what that character, what the, no, what Adam, as portrayed now by a new actor, is, is feeling. I got a sense from a three second clip and that gives me hope for the future of the character. It's a very controversial recast and I think it's, I still, I think it's going to be a good recast from what I've seen already uh, and just in general I feel like I need to accept it, I intend to accept it, and I think I'm going to be justified because I remember back uh, when Adam was very first cast as an adult. It was an actor named Chris Engen. He wasn't on the show very long and I liked him in the role. I thought he was kind of cool and there was like kind of a controversial exit if you remember when he left the show and I was not happy about the fact that they recast him with Michael Mooney. You can go back, you can look on YouTube and find the early videos where M Michael Mooney had just come onto the show and the, the first few months I was constantly saying I'm just not feeling it. <laughs> I just don't like him. I don't think he's attractive. And then, I mean, you see me all the way back up into a year ago singing his praises. Michael Mooney was the one that made Adam my favorite character on the show. He blew me away. He drew me into YNR in a way I hadn't been in a long time. So I went from not liking the actor and being resistant to the recast to all of a sudden loving all of it, living for all of it. So I I think that we need to let uh, the new actor, oh, what's his name? Um, I can't remember his name. Oh, shoot, I'm just, oh, I could just kick myself for not remembering it. But I think that we need to let the new actor into our lives. I think we need to give him a chance. He could be the one to take the character of Adam to the next level. And you never know, it could be amazing. So, this week it's time to tell Faith the bad news that Mommy and Daddy are not going to be getting married. And Faith, ooh, she didn't take it so well. It was kind of brutal for both Nick and Sharon. Uh, I mean, well, I think Sharon had this sense of like, and I'm sure Faith could pick up on it, 
I still want to marry daddy. Daddy just doesn't want to marry me anymore. Sorry, little girl, everything changed in our life overnight, and now Faith is screaming at Nick, you said you'd marry mommy, you're a liar. Not easy for him to hear, I'm sure. But surprising moment of the week, Mariah took it so much better. I'm shocked. Last week I predicted and completely assumed that Mariah was going to use this as an, a reason to hate Sharon. Totally the opposite. Mariah was so nice to Sharon. Uh, and, I mean, she had her first face-to-face -face after learning the truth, and Sharon even said, please, I've had enough. Uh, please don't join on the bandwagon and kick me while I'm down. And Mariah said, you know, I, I don't agree with what you did, but you, you know, essentially you've done a lot for me and I'm not going to kick you while you're down. I understand what it's like to make a mistake. So I just, I, I was really, really shocked. Mariah even had a run in with Summer where she defended Sharon. Summer is at the underground and she's filling Austin in on the entire thing and Mariah walks in. Summer is immediately jumping all over Sharon saying she's a bitch. How could she have done this to me? And Mariah just lashes back at her and says, you know, boo-hoo. So you didn't know which rich, awesome guy was your father for a whole year of your life. Try not having a father. Grow up, princess, is what she said, which I kind of appreciated. I feel a little mixed about it because I, I just, as a viewer, enjoyed Mariah getting out her claws and saying, Hew! and then just ripping Summer a little bit to shreds because uh, I think Summer is whiny and she is passive aggressive and I kind of like her having an enemy. At the same time though, just stepping back from the situation, doesn't Summer have a right to be upset about what Sharon did to her? Look, the thing is, Sharon did an awful thing. Sharon did a bad thing um, and it did affect Summer's life. If Phyllis has the right to be upset at Sharon for uh, everything that she did, then certainly Summer does too. Uh, so I think Summer has a, a right to her feelings, uh, but at the same time I liked that Mariah was like, just take it down a notch. I don't know! If I was Summer I think I would be equally as mad. If I was Summer I would probably feel the way she feels towards Sharon. Uh, but at the, at the same time I just don't want to have, I have a hard time jumping on board a Let's Hate Sharon bandwagon. A lot of people have mentioned to me over the course of the last several weeks that YNR really has not done the world's greatest job of presenting Sharon's situation as a mental illness situation. It's pretty clear that YNR with the old producers, the old management, the old crew. So they took Sharon all the way down. I mean, they, oh Lord. I, she did all of these bad things, including her marriage to Victor and uh, trying to sell his company and all that stuff. They dragged Sharon right down through the mud and the new regime kind of came in and, and I, I, in my opinion, they kind of used the mental illness as a way to just write off some of the things that she had done and I think now they use it more as a plot device than an opportunity to actually talk about a mental illness which might help the character of Sharon. I think there's still a lot of Sharon hate out there in the fan community and in Genoa City and if Wayner did a better job of, of presenting what it what it's like for her to have the mental illness then maybe there could be some more compassion for her but as as it stands now, it's just like Sharon's just going, oh yeah, I had a mental illness and um, I'm better now. I'm on my meds, which is kind of not how it, it really works. Um, so I have compassion for Sharon. I just, I can't help it. I just can't help myself, which is why also Grace showing up at her door this week. It was so good and bad and everything all at once. I really enjoyed that. I mean, the second Sharon flung open that door and saw Grace's face, I just, oh, it was good. I mean, I'm just imagining what on earth Grace could be doing there. I, I, like, I, she, she said to some, she, I can't remember what her first words were, but it was like, Sharon, 
hi. And in my head, I was doing my own voiceover for the scene. Actually, it wasn't in my head. I was doing it out loud. I was going, Sharon, hi. I heard there was some trouble in your marriage, and I just thought maybe this would be a good time for me to come by and have sex with Nick. <laughs> what she was thinking. She claimed to not know anything about the trouble in their marriage, but Grace Turner only comes around to check the temperature on Sharon and Nick's relationship to see if she can get on him herself. And I'm sure that's what she's going to do. I don't know if there's going to be more episodes with Grace or not, but you know she's going to be slinking up on him, whether we see it on screen or not. There's blood in the water. But of course, Grace first presented it as, oh, I just, I just wanted to come and, and see, uh, I was hoping I would run into Mariah, and it was very awkward, uh, Mariah was there, and Grace is coming face to face with her for the first time, uh, but it wasn't altruistic, okay, Grace, I think, yes, she probably was interested in seeing Mariah, okay, I'll give you that, but, I think we all know what your real agenda is because, oh, it got pretty bad. <laughs> Mariah left and Sharon and Grace started having kind of a frank conversation. I mean, it went from civil to suspicious to downright catty in just a matter of moments. And I thought, oh, how humiliating for Sharon. She pretty much had to admit that Nick was not going through with the marriage. And Grace is taken aback by this and says, well, um, he loves you. I mean, I threw myself at him when I was here last time, as per usual. And, you know, he was totally committed to you for right now. And Sharon was like, you gotta be kidding me. Get out of my house. It really, really quickly devolved, as if there was any question. Uh, and it really, it ended up with Grace just kind of ooh, taking Sharon's nose and and smearing uh, smearing her nose in it, which was probably good for anyone uh, who's not a Sharon fan. Maybe maybe Grace represents the non-Sharon fan coming in and saying, "Oh, really? Because you had a man who completely loved you, was completely committed to you, and somehow you managed to screw it up. So what did you do, Sharon?" <laughs> I don't think Sharon told Grace exactly what it was, um, but I, I, you know, again, I just felt bad for Sharon because here she can't be more than 48 hours off of this whole revelation and life change, and now here she is experiencing ultimate humiliation in front of one of her worst enemies who would love nothing more than to see her fall flat on her face. So, <laughs> felt bad for Sharon, but it was also a delicious scene between the two. Uh, and meanwhile, Nick is up at the ranch talking to Nikki when Victor walks in. And uh, Nick is completely expecting Victor to rub his nose in it, which he did in one way or another. Um, there's just this moment where Victor is telling Nick that he needs to realize Sharon is not good for our family. She's not. She's no good for you. Uh, so you need to have nothing to do with her. And it causes, of course, more of a rift between Victor and Nick. And Nick is saying, you know, were you happy? You were the one that revealed this information. You got any more big bombshells you'd like to tell me about? Clearly, Nick is resentful. He leaves the ranch. And there was this beautiful, beautiful representative moment between Nikki and Victor where Victor is saying uh, basically um, that maybe Nick needs to hear the harsh reality so that he can know better than to go back to Sharon. And Nikki says, yes, Victor. Nick may be devastated right now, but Sharon is the love of his life and we both know how difficult it is to say goodbye forever on something like that. And I thought, yes, that sums up my feelings about the Nick and Sharon situation exactly. Nick is right now all about how he is never going to get back together with Sharon. He's never going to live in that house with her again. Never going to forgive her. Can't trust her with faith. But we all know it's only a matter of time. I think that the Nick, the story of Nick and Sharon individually is the story of their journey to and from each other. Phyllis, 
finds a photo of Kelly in Jack's desk drawer. Why would he have a photo of Kelly, the woman Billy had an affair with, in his desk drawer? Hmm, that's really odd. Good thing Billy walked right through the door and she started questioning him about the photo and Phyllis did make a good point in this moment. She says, you know, right now everyone is mad at me for withholding the truth from Jack about what Sharon did and Summer's paternity, but withholding the truth is exactly what you're all doing to me. And I thought, yes. Yes, that is very true. Uh, it doesn't make either side of that coin correct, but it is very true. And Billy tries to calm her down, tries to give her no information, yet again, he doesn't return her honesty with honesty, but he does finally tell her the truth about Delia. I'm surprised it hasn't come up before now. I'm surprised that Phyllis hasn't asked about Delia to anyone and they said, oh, oh well, thing is, I, that, no, that hasn't happened and that was a little perplexing to me so I was very glad to see Phyllis finally learn the truth about Delia, but <laughs> I did laugh a little bit because it seemed like Phyllis was a little bit more worried about the photo of Kelly and Jack's desk than she really was about the Delia situation. Or maybe that's just why Anar didn't decide to dwell on that piece. And she did say, Billy, I'm really sorry. She was entirely sympathetic for what he had gone through, but then she went right back to that photo. What is going on here? So just as that's going on, Jack and Kelly are in her office at the athletic club having a moment of realization that they've been kept apart and it can't go on any longer. Kelly is almost pushily uh, happy that she's won Jack's favor. She believes she's won, that Jack has ultimately decided to come to her. She has so little to go on. The fact that he jumped on top of you in his office uh, and, and that he's being kind of wishy-washy about what he wants. I mean, I think Jack has given her the lip service, but it's the same thing he's doing to Phyllis and has been doing to Phyllis. He's just sort of going through the motions, not really being committal to either woman, yet Kelly seems completely completely uh, head and feet in the water right now. So she's saying, I'm so glad you're deciding to go with me. And, and Jack, he sort of goes with the wind. When he's with Kelly, he wants to be with Kelly. When he's with Phyllis, he wants to be with Phyllis. So in this moment in Kelly's office, he's leading her to believe, leading the audience to believe he's gonna cut it off with Phyllis. He's gonna tell her everything uh, and uh, gonna move on. And I just thought it was interesting and I zeroed in on the fact that Kelly was smooching up all on Jack, like ready to just be back in his arms as if nothing happened. Well, nothing, it's not that nothing happened. Something big and major happened and you can't just sweep it under the rug and go smooch mooch face with him. He's realizing that he has to go home and talk to Phyllis and tell her everything and it's not going to be a happy situation and excuse me if I don't feel particularly sexual right now. <laughs> I don't know why that moment stuck with me of all of the moments, but it's clear that the Kelly versus Phyllis rivalry is heating up. Kelly's telling Jack, you know, that woman kept the truth from you, so you need to stay with me. And Jack's going, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So he goes home. And he comes face to face with Phyllis for the first time. And we as the audience know, she's found that picture. And Jack knows, he's, we also know that Jack is going to try to break it off with her. But it's kind of difficult. It's not a, it's not a straight path to it. Jack starts uh, asking her questions again. I think Jack is trying, like, rather than just saying, I have something to tell you, I met someone, blah, blah. Rather than just putting it out on the table, I think Jack is delaying a little bit, kind of seeing how Phyllis responds to some questions before, uh, or maybe even uh, helping him decide if he's going to tell her the truth. Uh, but he, you know, he says to her, how could you do that to me? And she says, yeah, okay, fine, fine. I put Revenge for Sharon above your feelings. I am sorry. That's who I am. I am crazy. I am impulsive. And I take things to the edge. That is the person that you fell in love with. And I just thought, oh. Well, swing, just swing back in the Phyllis direction, Jack, why don't you? Because it was an awesome plea 
It was an awesome performance. Uh, the, this actress, uh, she's just blowing me away. I love it. I love her portrayal here. The way she had herself worked up just in that span of time was, uh, it was so effective. It was so beautiful. Um, and I think it was enough to sway Jack back in the opposite direction. He gets a phone call from something at work and he leaves, but he accidentally leaves his cell phone behind. And Phyllis is just keeping it under her hat that she has found this photo. She's not accepting, uh, I think Billy came up with some excuse about it being a press photo. It's in their media kit. No, 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 no. I don't think so. He kept Kelly's photo in the same drawer that he kept Phyllis's ring. Uh, so, uh, no, something's up. So she grabs his phone and she hacks into it. <laughs> Takes her like two tries. She hacked his, what, didn't she hack his tablet earlier? Now this time she's hacking his phone. Jack is very, very predictable, apparently, or she knows him very, very well. But what she finds are uh, is Kelly's phone, Kelly's number in Jack's phone, and some of their messages back and forth saying, I love you, I love you too. She tries to sell, tell herself, okay, maybe that's just old information. But as Phyllis is holding the phone, a text message comes through from Kelly talking about how hopeful she's feeling after their conversation today and Phyllis realizes the full scope of their relationship that it wasn't going on just when she was in the coma it's going on now <laughs> oh. you think you think Sharon got it bad for keeping a secret Phyllis is going to make mincemeat out of Jack Abbott uh, it, when, ja <laughs> when Jack gets home the show begins. It was the equivalent. It is now the equivalent of Phyllis taking Sharon up through that stairwell. That's what she's going to do to Jack. As soon as Jack gets home, she says, well, there is something I think we need to talk about. I found the ring. And she shows the ring to Jack. She knows everything at this point. Rather than telling him or confronting him about it, she's going to play a little game. She shows, you know, says, well, I found the ring. So that means we're getting engaged. We're getting married. Uh, we're so happy together and we're getting married. And I think that we should have some photos taken and we should have a big engagement party at the athletic club. Oh, oh, oh. And you know who should plan it? This Kelly that I keep hearing so much about. I hear she's General City's best event planner. We should have her for this. Just to watch him squirm. <laughs> oh, I gotta hand it to Phyllis. That was one hell of a move. I wasn't expecting it and I was impressed by it. I 100% think she intends to go through with this big engagement party. I think that's how we're gonna see this whole thing climax. There's gonna be a big old engagement party. And I think Phyllis would love nothing more than to stand there at that big engagement party with Jack on her arm, flaunting it in Kelly's face. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think this is, you know, I feel bad a little bit for Jack because she, she's, she, uh, yeah. I mean, he's ultimately getting a little bit of played right now. She's not being totally truthful with him right now, but this is so totally not about Jack. I think Phyllis loves Jack, respects Jack, and I don't think she wants to hurt Jack with what she's planning and doing right at this point. I think this is about revenge on Kelly now. It's always some other woman. It's always the other woman. You know, if it's not Christine, then it's Sharon. Now it's Kelly. This is about revenge on Kelly, just like it was about revenge on Sharon. <sighs> Phyllis is not happy with this woman who has come in and crashed into her family's life while she was laying off in a coma. Now is Stitch's big chance. He's going to finally tell Victoria the, uh, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Maureen begs him, begs him not to tell the truth. I mean, she was so worked up in that scene. She, they're in the lab together, and she is so passionately trying to beg him not to tell Victoria the truth. She almost passes out in the process. I mean, she was using up so much energy. <laughs> I thought, ooh, 
She's gonna have a heart attack if she's not careful there. <laughs> but Stitch is gonna do it. He goes to the athletic club. He is planning a, a really nice, intimate dinner for he and Victoria where he tells her the truth about who he really is and is hopeful that he can build a life with her whether or not he's the father of her baby. <laughs> the problem is Maureen. She's not gonna take it lying down. Uh, Stitch, goes when he goes off to make his meal plans, uh, Maureen is goes to the bathroom, comes out into the hall, bumps into Victoria. Now Victoria has just come from a conversation with Nikki, drunk old Nikki, where yet again apparently no one can smell vodka ever. You got a, gla you got a glass right here? Can you can't smell it. Got oh, oh, her breath always smells like vodka and Altoids? No. Who knows? So nobody can guess that. Who could possibly guess that? Please. So uh, the, and Victoria's just had this conversation with Nikki where Nikki kind of lets slip uh, that Stitch might not be guilty of the crime. Remember, she was hiding off in the bathroom a couple weeks ago and she heard that conversation between Maureen and Stitch. So she knows there's more to the story, desperately wants to tell her daughter, but doesn't want to blow Maureen's confidence because Maureen's got something on her. Too. But Nikki kind of lets slip, hey, maybe he's innocent, and that plants that seed in Victoria's head. So when she and Maureen run into each other in the hallway, Victoria starts really asking questions. And in fact, she kind of guesses the outcome. I mean, she, she guesses anyway that Stitch is covering for someone. And at first, she assumes it's Kelly. Kelly must have been the one that shot your, uh, shot your husband, uh, uh, and he's covering for her. Well, I'm gonna go tell her off. And Maureen says, no, 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 no. It's not Kelly. She was away at school at the time. It couldn't have been her. She was at least not gonna let her daughter take the fall too for what we've already guessed weeks ago. Um, but uh, then Victoria guesses, well, if it's not Kelly, who could it be? It's Mommy Dearest. So Victoria completely just guesses that Maureen was the one who killed her husband and let Stitch take the fall for it. Victoria's not having it. No, 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 no. She gets out her cell phone and says, I'm going to call the police right now. I'm mean, just ready to like, come to Javot and get this woman. She confessed as of, <laughs> but I'm Victoria Newman. Surely that should work. And Maureen is terrified. I mean, she's said on multiple occasions, I can't let this secret come out, especially not to the Newmans. They would have us tarred and feathered over this or have me tarred and feathered over this, especially. So uh, Maureen does stop Victoria from making the phone call and goes on to uh, tell the truth. She um, tells Victoria, you know, I, I, I think she said, um, I killed their father to save them. And what followed was us getting Maureen's side of the story finally. The revelation wasn't really uh, what, who killed the father. It was the backstory. That was the part that we didn't get. And Maureen did go on uh, to, uh, to, to give the to backstory. Uh, she was essentially a battered woman and, uh, and uh, the husband had lost his job and it had become violent, which I think is a, a common story, um, or at least not an uncommon story. Story. But um, the father started also hitting on the kids, and Maureen was able to get Kelly to go away to school, but Stitch stayed home, and she, it was really, I thought uh, Meredith Baxter gave just a wonderful performance. I really felt her. I was with her. Um, she gave she gave the portrayal. I believed she was Maureen. I believed she had this history. And she had this line where she, uh, or part of the story was that, you know, when the husband started beating on Ben, uh, he would just take it and he wouldn't say anything. And I just, it touched my heart when she said that because I know there are a lot of kids out there that just take it you know, and don't fight back, can't fight back, and it made me sad, and she explained, you know, she didn't feel like she could fight back, but as, you know, as the husband kept hitting her, uh, Ben didn't mind taking the beating himself, but when it was about her, um, the, it caused a lot of friction in the family, obviously, but just the way she described it, I, I felt her, um, I felt the performance. I felt like I was there, but uh, what she she filled in the blanks about what happened the night of the father's murder. Basically, 
Ben went out to the barn. We all heard that part of the story. They had an argument. Ben punched him and then ran out of the barn. Maureen comes in and just beaten down both physically and emotionally. She describes how she uh, like poured around some paint cans I think she said and lit a match and burned down the barn and I loved the little details that she gave it was so easy it was no time at all before the flames had hit the, the ceiling I mean she hated this man this man hated her and was doing this horrible thing to her and she had struggled and had, and her life was so hard for so long and the easiest thing she did was to light the match I thought that was that's a really good uh, description. I mean, I was really with her and I really got into her side of the story at that moment. Um, but it's still selfish for her to let her son, her only son, take the blame for something that she did. She should have copped to it. And that's what I think. And that's what Victoria thinks. And although Victoria was very empathetic toward what she had gone through, she says, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to let that go. You know, I'm gonna, I got to go. I got to find Ben. I got to tell the truth about this. So she goes to leave, even though Maureen, Maureen's like right behind her begging her not to tell the truth about her story Maureen chases her into a stairwell I thought oh uh oh <laughs> nothing good happens in a stairwell in this town I honestly I thought is she gonna knock her down the stairs is Ma Maureen gonna push Victoria down the stairs and have her miscarry this child I was gonna be real disappointed if that happens uh, that's not what happened uh, instead they run out into a parking garage where Maureen very swiftly takes Victoria's, or Victoria drops her purse, Maureen pushes her into a janitor's closet and locks the door. Eh. Swift. So this is a real smooth move, Maureen. How could that possibly backfire on you? What was she thinking? What are you gonna do, leave her in there to die just like you did your husband? It was such a dumb, dumb move. I mean, Victoria's in there now beating on the door saying, let me out of here, let me out of here. And Maureen is having a complete breakdown, like emotional, physical breakdown out there going, oh, I can't, I don't know what to do, I can't live. Like all she knows is that the secret cannot come out and she's willing to do anything to stop it from coming out. I mean, she's already killed once. <laughs> Who we'll says she's not going to do it again? She's completely unraveling. Victoria's saying, Ben's not going to forgive you for this. He's not going to let you get out of the way with this. And Maureen's saying, Ben, he'll, ben, he'll cover for me. He'll take care of me. He always has. And she is so totally distraught. She uh, is listening to Victoria. And I mean, I don't know the way I got the vibe from her. is like, is she hearing voices in her head or something? Like she's like grabbing onto her head. It was an ordeal. She flips on the exhaust fans, which I didn't not know at the time what the heck that was. I was like, is it a heater? Is she gonna like blast heat into that room and Victoria's gonna sweat to death? Or I don't know what it was, but she turns on these exhaust fans um, at later kind of realizing that it was to drown out the sound of Victoria's screaming. And she's just trying to figure out what to do in this parking garage where apparently no one else is. And she's so upset she collapses on the floor having a heart attack. She was on the phone with Ben at the time. So he comes to the garage to help her realizing she's having a heart attack to get her to the hospital. Uh, but he doesn't hear Victoria screaming. Oh man. <laughs> <sighs> Maureen gets to the hospital and she's completely fine, but of course, of course, Victoria goes into labor in the janitor's closet. <sighs> Why wouldn't she? <laughs> All alone in a freaking jan dirty janitor's closet. Victoria knew it. Don't worry, it'll be okay. Chelsea gave birth last year in a dirty warehouse. So don't worry, Victoria's gonna be fine doing it in a janitor's closet. Ugh, it was so hard watching. Um, I don't know if Maureen's gonna ultimately tell them where she is, but Victoria's stuck in this room. There's a padlock on it, and a, no, nobody can hear her screaming. What a nightmare. 
I can't help putting myself in her situation and it's just is like, ugh, that'd be the worst. Um, she is in labor trying to delay the labor, but at the same time realizing that it's coming, she's just trying to like take her mind to a happy place and she starts to imagine all of the possibilities. We have this, we, we start on upon the, this, these sort of dream sequences, past, present, future, dreams, imagination, way things should have been, way things could be. Uh, it was a series of scenes. She's imagining the possibilities, remembering the memories that she's had with both Stitch and Billy. And I think that the, the, the sequences were a really creative way to sum up how she feels about both men. My takeaway from it was that, uh, particularly in one scene, uh, Victoria thinks that Billy is so loving and he's so supportive and he's so fun and he's such a good father, but he's not reliable. There was a scene where he was totally taking care of uh, Johnny as he was sick and he got him a big stuffed giraffe and flowers for Victoria, but he forgot to pick up the kid's medication. That was a good way to summarize how she would feel about Billy. That, I thought that was very, very clever. And Stitch, on the other hand, is somewhat opposite. He's reliable, but she believes that and knows that he's he hasn't been completely honest with her. I mean, there's way more pros probably now at this point uh, to, to life with uh, Stitch. I mean, why not? But, you know, she, it was clear that she feels torn between the two men, that she loves the two men, and I thought seeing those um, those sequences w was very revealing. I mean, even I, d I did think it was interesting and that it said something that even in this horrifying moment, even after learning the, st the truth about Stitch, Victoria was thinking of Billy. So that's not completely closed in her mind, even though now she knows that Ben is a good guy and probably will end up with him. But she's just so torn between the two of them. Um, ultimately, she arrives back at the same conclusion as she did before. Uh, she's got, you know, Ben, Billy, Ben, Billy, Ben, Billy, ah, ah, this is my baby. That's what she came up with before, you know, and why she decided not to get the paternity test. She wanted to focus on her and her child, and she said out loud uh, at the end of the scene in the janitor's closet, this is my baby, it's just you and me now. So I don't know, I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, Abby ends up going to find Victoria at her house, um, mentioning that she was at Jabot. Billy and Stitch are already looking for her. I, I mean, of course, ultimately they're going to find her. I just don't know if it's gonna be before or after she's already given birth. Uh, the, the, the baby is coming, uh, so maybe soon, I don't know, maybe soon we're gonna find out finally who the father is. Paul gets his background check uh, on Joe and it reveals that he's he's on the up and up, he's clean, which is too bad because I'd prefer him a little dirty. <laughs> I like Joe a lot. I liked that boxing scene between him and Kane. I like I like Joe's persona as the confident, cocky business guy. I also like seeing him let his hair down and be a little loose and a little bit fun. This is gonna be a good character. <laughs> Just trust me on this one. <laughs> um, I think there's still a lot that we need to be, get revealed about Joe's character. Uh, there's a lot of question about what his motives are with this development deal he's working on. There have been a couple of times where the question has come up, who is the investor? Joe's just the broker. He's not Mr. Money behind all this thing. He couldn't have he couldn't have dreamt up this situation just to put Dylan out of business and just to get back together with Avery. So I, uh, honestly, am kind of thinking, Victor's the investor. I think one of these times Joe's going to end up having a meeting uh, with the investor and it's going to maybe maybe Victor will spin around in a chair to re reveal himself or something. I mean, uh, uh, Joe has already said he knows who Victor Newman is, of course, has been talking about it with Kane and how Victor offered Kane a job. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking Victor's the investor. Uh, not so much that he want, that Victor has some kind of vendetta against uh Dylan, but I think that it would, you know, be not a bad way to put Victor and Paul at ends with each other. You know, Paul and Dylan versus Victor and Joe? 
Maybe? I think that could be good. Uh, the Avery thing for Joe, I think, is the icing on the cake. Uh, he goes to her office uh, and pretty much admits that he has a personal agenda, uh, says that he, he, he wants the best for Avery, but at the same time, he insulted her by saying, you know, you, this is what you do. You, you bailed on me, you bailed on our marriage, you bailed on Nick, and now eventually you're gonna end up bailing on Dylan too. I, I, I appreciated his point uh, uh, about um, Avery uh, having the affair with Dylan instead of trying to communicate with Joe and work things out. It was a fair point and it gave Joe a side. Uh, all we ever knew about Avery and her relationship with Joe was that he was a workaholic and he wasn't paying attention to her so she turned to another man. But now Joe has a perspective too. You know, you, we could have gone to marriage counseling. There were a million other things we could have done. You chose the quick way out. And maybe that does say something about Avery's character. I thought it was a good point, uh, and she smacked him for it. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> she gives him a, a good whack across the face, and then he kisses her. <laughs> Which, by the way, is the best action to follow a slap. <laughs> I wish every slap was followed by a kiss. <laughs> It was good. It was real, real good. And I will mention to you, even though I haven't appreciated and enjoyed Avery and Dylan's relationship, let us not fail to overlook that Avery had the opportunity but did not tell Dylan about the kiss. Although Michael's cancer storyline has made me incredibly sad. I do appreciate the way that it's unfolding. I have felt that over the years, Michael and Kevin have had a very realistic brotherly relationship. I think it's been a real portrayal of what a brother-brother relationship actually is like. They are two men who raised in sort of the same way uh, by sort of the same, you know, the same mother, but they really couldn't be more different. One grew up to be very responsible and one grew up to be a little wacky, but they are loving and supportive of one another. Not like most of the other rivalrous brother relationships we've seen on the show. Think about it. How many soap opera brothers are friends? You know, I mean, go, go back and, th and think through the list on this soap, on the other soaps that you watch. Typically, when you have two brothers, they're enemies. Um, I can't think of any other brother-brother relation relationships that have been positive. Well, Billy and Jack are, are positive, that's true. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, you know, you got your Adams and your Nick, and it's usually some kind of rivalry. I like the, I like the brotherly relationship between these two. So I also like that Kevin is being the first one to find out about Michael's cancer. I like that Kevin is being allowed to express his feelings about it, uh, and I like that Kevin is trying to guide Michael in the right direction for once. It's a role reversal. Michael is wanting to keep the cancer to himself, and Kevin is pushing him to confide in Lauren, to tell Lauren all about it. Um, one of the things I realized this week uh, is that one of the reasons Michael is not wanting to tell Lauren the truth is because he's afraid that sex is so important to their relationship, as we've seen. You know, when, when Michael and Lauren are off sexually, they're off in a very big emotional way. And Michael is afraid that sex is so important to their marriage that being without it because he has the cancer could be a major problem for him and he said something to Lauren this week in a scene about uh, you know being afraid that he wasn't enough of a partner for her enough of a husband for her and I think that really uh, summarized it um, I, 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 I get what he means and I think it's a good portrayal of the insecurity that someone would feel, you know, uh, having cancer, um, feeling that uh, the person that you love, your partner, won't love you the same way once they realize that you're sick 
or that you're broken or that you're anything less than the amazing person that they married. And I just, I, you know, I thought it was that was a very realistic emotion. And I can imagine that Michael feels worried about going from being the strong partner to being a burden for Lauren. Um, so I get his, I get his perspective. But I think that Lauren is stronger than that. I think Lauren is more empathetic than that. I think she's going to be more supportive than that. Um, at the end of this, I, I believe that Michael and Lauren are going to, I mean, I, I believe that Michael's going to ultimately come through to the other side. We still don't know how serious the cancer is, what stage the cancer is. Uh, so we don't know the severity and we don't know how long it's all going to, I don't know what the journey is going to be like. But I believe that at the end of the journey, Michael and Lauren are going to learn what a, a true partnership really is all about. And I guess if it takes if it takes cancer to get them there, I'm feeling that it's still an important story to tell. Inserting Colin into the Devon Hillary relationship is genius. I love it so much. I think there are so many different directions that it could go now. I mean, now the Devon, Hillary, Neil triangle isn't just, ooh, is she going to get pregnant and with whose baby? There's a blackmail element in here and I kind of like it. <laughs> uh, Colin goes to visit Hillary this week and he does a pretty good idea or a pretty good job of giving her the idea that he knows all about her dirty little secret enough to really shake her I, after the conversation Colin goes out into the hallway and here's Hillary making a phone call to Devon saying I think Colin saw us he knows something and then Colin so that this is confirmation of exactly what was going on so then Colin goes to the athletic club and lets Devon know oh so subtly that he knows what's going on it's 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 created um an unexpected twist in my mind. It's not just your flat romantic triangle. I like that there's also going to be some blackmail and some business storyline inserted in here as well. Uh, because clearly, we know Joe needs, intends, wants to buy the athletic club as part of his big development deal. And we all know that Colin wants to please Joe and get in with him and get some money. And we all know that Devon is the owner of the athletic club. YNR made sure to say it about a dozen times this week, just in case anyone forgot the plot point that Devon is the owner of the athletic club. I mean, really, that scene between him and Neil where they're like, hey, owner of the athletic club uh, is that get buying dinner here. Oh, the owner. Hey, the, and Devon saying, yeah, you know, I know I'm the owner. We're, we're, you know, did you know that Devon Hamilton, that guy right there is the owner of this athletic club? It was so obvious. I was like, come on, YNR. <laughs> I guess you got to catch you got to catch people up. Maybe there's new viewers watching, so I won't be too cynical about about that. But, you know, I mean, they said it like a dozen times. I'm not even kidding you. So it's clear that Colin is going to use Devon's relationship with Hillary as blackmail to forcing Devon to sell the athletic club with Colin's intention of getting that deal done and taking a slice of that pie. And I tell you, it's going to put Kane right in the middle again, which is exactly where I like him. And I, I just feel like... It's, it's, it's going in an unexpected way. It's, it's a twist that has tendrils that are, or tentacles, yeah, tentacles, that, that reach into many people's lives because Colin's going to pull this whole jive with um, Devon and Hillary and who knows how Neil will get involved and Joe as well is obviously involved in this. But also, Kane is, yet again, he's going to have a problem because this is, gonna, Kane is on both sides of this. He understands Joe perspective and what he wants. He understands and is the only one who understands that Devon and Hillary are having an affair. So when this whole blackmail thing that Colin's trying to do goes down, uh, you know, he, Kane's going to be in the middle. Lily is going to want to save the athletic club. He's, she's going to want Devon to keep the athletic club so she can keep her job and her job with her husband that she loves very much. But Kane, no, 
knows that this secret with Devon and Hillary cannot come out. So Kane's between a rock and a hard place. Oh, it's gonna be good. Hey, did you guys know that Devon is the owner of the athletic club? Let's read some comments. There were so many comments this week. In like insanity, you guys have got opinions. I love it. Um, I'm gonna start out with Henry, who left a voicemail for me this week. Now, last week I had um kind of gone off on Victor a little bit for being so smug watching Sharon's downfall, but Henry reminds me she burned down the man's ranch. <laughs> <laughs> with all of his memorabilia, all his photos, all his mustache combs probably too, right? Uh, uh, Sharon deserves whatever she gets, Henry says, and I hope it's nothing. <laughs> I, I do have a tendency, I know, to want to defend Sharon. I don't know what it is. She just makes me want to. It's like, it's like the way Nick is always defending Sharon. All of a sudden, I'm always defending her too. But I do have to acknowledge that Victor has a reason to dislike Sharon. If the woman burnt down my my house, I would feel the same. <laughs> my problem is I can see everybody's point of view, so I'm never really too uh, narrowed in my in my opinions about people. I'm always kind of, I always end up flipping flopping back and forth because I just put myself in their shoes, and then there you go, I see their point. Um, Michael also left me a voicemail, and <laughs> it was kind of great. He was like, "Welcome back, Grace." I I loved Michael's voicemail, just really like zooming in on Grace. He, he said, I'm going to quote him here, I love me a tacky tramp. <laughs> I thought that was great because I get to experience her trampness on uh, on Bold and the Beautiful quite a bit. Uh, so, But it was nice to see her back in uh, Genoa City because uh, the character that she plays on Bold and the Beautiful is not quite as much of a over-the-top sex kitten as she is when she comes into Genoa City. Uh, and so it's kind of it's kind of neat to see her. And Michael um, mentioned that, I mean, Michael appreciated Grace's presence but also told her off by saying, you know, Grace was telling Mariah, I would have tried to bring you back to Sharon if I had known that there was a twin, uh, 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 but she didn't. The, uh, the original storyline, Grace tried to run away with Cassie. Uh, so it was like trying to present Grace like she was very um, um, like Mother Teresa there in that situation and she wasn't, not at all. But Michael also made the point of, hey, why don't we bring Grace back a little more often and not only have her inserted into the Nick and Sharon storylines, but why not get her out into the mix with other people in Genoa City? You guys will have to let me know what you think about that. Did you like seeing Grace? Do you want to see more Grace? Um, okay, Silvana left me a really thoughtful, uh, always thoughtful voicemail, and she n really nailed something that I hadn't thought of and that I appreciated. Silvana says uh, she was uh, upset with Nick a little bit uh, because he left Sharon, and uh, Silvana went on to say Nick lacks the strength of making a commitment. When things get hard, he looks for something easy. And I thought that is very, very true. When his relationship with Sharon got hard, obviously the loss of their daughter, he went to Phyllis because it was uncomplicated. And now here he is yet again with Sharon and something that's complicated and he's looking for something easier. I thought that's such a good point. He 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 doesn't have that commitment. He doesn't have that stick to itiveness. Um, Silvana also goes on to say that she wishes Sharon could get involved with someone who could be a little more committed than Nick, but doesn't have the same baggage as Adam does. Now, um, Ellen C left me a comment at yrchat.com and she says, like you, I'm glad the Sharon secret storyline is wrapping up. It looks like Nick is going to leave her, even though he said the secret didn't matter and nothing would ever come between them. Great. This leaves Sharon available for Adam. <laughs> I think they are perfect together. Flawed, complicated people who really just want to be loved. Oh, I, I thought so too. I was thinking the exact same thing this week because the couples are getting all mixed up. And 
And although I am a Nick and Sharon fan, I was also an Adam and Sharon fan. And I'm kind of wondering how the couples are going to come down. Like, we need to know what choice Victoria is going to make. Because if Victoria chooses to go with Stitch, then Billy will stay with Chelsea, which means Chelsea and Adam might not get back together, and Adam might go uh, looking to Sharon for some help. They're both on the outside, and they're both going to need allies in this town once uh, the truth comes out. I don't know where that puts Nick. Mm, seems like there's like, they don't need to be three guys fighting over Avery, so I don't know who Nick would be with, but I think it's a little bit up in the air right now, and um, obviously I like it. Uh, Gary called into my voicemail with two points that I wanted to zero in on. I didn't know, but Gary told me Gloria is going to be coming to Bold and the Beautiful to do a guest spot. Uh, yay! I don't know. Is she going to be Gloria? Like, is she going to play Gloria? Because uh, Lauren has been a crossover character, so maybe they're going to say she's Lauren's mother-in-law, or is she going to be a completely different character? I love it. I, I love that I'm going to see Gloria doing a guest spot on the Bold and the Beautiful. Why can't Gloria do a guest spot on YNR <laughs> sometime soon? That might be nice. <laughs> um, I mean, especially with Michael's cancer storyline, where's Gloria? That's got to be coming up, right? They're not going to let that slip. Uh, but anyway, back to Gary. He uh, did mention one thing. I mean, so many good points this week, Gary, but I have to say... Um, Gary mentioned uh, the new Adam looks a little young for the part, and I thought the same thing. Immediately when the bandages came off, my when I first saw his face revealed, it, I believe it was when he was looking in the mirror, I thought, he looks young. How old's that guy? He, I mean, I know he's been on other soaps, so is he, I mean, he's got to be in his 30s, but he's got a baby face. That, whatever plastic surgery he got done was real spot on because his skin looks nice and smooth and perfect and young. <laughs> I saw the same thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, Connor left me a voicemail, not real happy with Kelly. He says, who does Kelly think she is? Judging Phyllis's actions when she doesn't even know her. Uh, the way she was talking, I wanted Phyllis to push Kelly down the stairwell. <laughs> I love that. I thought that was pretty fantastic. Um, uh, one other thing, too. Uh, actually, there's a couple other things uh, that I, I wrote down and now I don't see. Anna had called into my voicemail. Darn it. I don't know where I, I thought I wrote that down on this sheet of paper, but I don't see it. But basically, oh, wait, here it is. Okay. Um, Anna, <laughs> I'm having trouble reading. Anna says, this, was, this is beautiful. I worked in a chemistry lab. <laughs> as a chemical lab tech, and I've never seen blue water in a chemistry lab. Yeah, I tell ya, that new Jabot lab set, I love it. I think it's so beautiful. It's bright, it's colorful, but I tell ya, <laughs> I know I don't know anything about chemistry, but I, I do know a little bit about fragrance blending, and I've never seen blue water in either one. And it's, I had to call back to, to Gary had left me a voicemail uh, earlier in the week, and he called the 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 jars of of colored water uh pastel gatorades <laughs> it does every time you look at the jabot said now i want you to think about how there's gatorade uh, in, in all of those jars it is kind of ridiculous i think it's a beautiful set but it does sort of take now that i'm used to it i was a little taken out of the moment before anna even left the voicemail i was a little taken out of the moment thinking you know the jars are kind of not realistic. I mean, what are we supposed to believe is in them? Toxic chemicals? Mm, they just have them in like jars with just glass lids? What is that? I don't know. Uh, Anna also did mention a point, and I just, I, I have to, I have to mention this. I hate to, but I, Anna mentioned it after I already noticed it. Ugh, she says, I, I was stunned. <laughs> or no, no, wait, wait, wait. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, oh, uh, Oh, shoot. Melody Thomas Scott is beautiful. She's gotten bigger. Why are they cinching her waist? Did you guys see what she was wearing on Monday? It, I tell ya, I stopped my screen and said out loud, like, what? The outfit she was wearing on Monday did not look very good. I don't care what Melody Thomas Scott weighs. I don't care. She's, she's beautiful. It's fine. But they need to dress her appropriately. I could not believe 
what I was looking at. It was just totally like they, uh, they need to dress her appropriately, please. Enough said. Um, I don't want to forget to say though too that Silvana in her message had just alluded to the fact that she didn't believe 100% that Sharon switched the paternity test results and then on YouTube Jennifer Budin and Aaron Brody mentioned the same thing that they still believe that Summer is Jack's child and I would love for somebody to elaborate that elaborate on that for me if Sharon didn't switch the paternity test then who did what happened do you guys have an opinion on this is there another twist coming that's something I really hadn't considered until Silvana and Jennifer and Aaron had mentioned it is it possible that Sharon's gonna get out of this hot water with a twist that she didn't actually switch the paternity test results. We never physically saw her doing it and I don't know that she totally remembers doing it. Maybe she just assumed that she did it. Uh, is there any chance that she, this transgression of Sharon's didn't really happen? Okay guys, that's it. <laughs> I hope you guys have a good week. Leave me lots of comments. You can write them here on YouTube or you can go to yrchat.com. Whatever works for you works for me. I love hearing from you. So next week, more Adam, I can't wait. <laughs> I'll see you then. Bye.